All right, remember, we are now live. Good morning, good morning. Hello, everybody. And remember, if possible, we're so happy to see all of you in possible not to walk across the middle of the aisle, Mr. Bankston. <laughs> Sorry, Reverend. <laughs> I forget what to call you, to be honest. <laughs> anyway, um, good morning. Good to see you all who are here in person. Uh, and those of you who are watching online, I hope you're enjoying this as much as the Olympics. Um, we are just as equally as exciting. Right, Bill? Yeah. Right, maybe. Okay, four quick announcements, if I can speak quickly, which is not my want. Uh, George is here today, leader of the book group over there, for those of you. And he brought a list of all the books the book group has read since their inception. It is a fascinating list, and there are some extra copies back there if anybody wants to pick them up to see about great books. They're so cool. There's so many good ones on here. And uh, if you want to join the book group, and if you're here on site, go see George, who's going to put his hand up in a minute. Da -da. And if you're not here and you're watching from afar and you want to join the book group, I have no clue what you can do to join up. You have to come on site one time, I guess, or email Bill or something. Okay, second announcement, Ordinary Women. We are meeting at Boynton Church in two weeks on Saturday the 14th to do our food pantry distribution. We could use another person or two to help with that. And also there's going to be a back-to-school event at the same time there to give kids school supplies and that type of thing. So if any, you don't have to be a woman to be an ordinary woman. Uh, we take spouses. All right, Don Sweat, I see you laughing over there. And that's good. We have a moral obligation to be happy. So good, good. We take women or men and we can use a few extra folks. Saturday, October 14th, if you need to know where to go, what to do, see me after class. Okay? What did I say? Okay, not October. August 14th. August 14th. All right, very good. Uh, third thing, still clean out your closets, your attics for musical instruments. Uh, Barbara Buckner is still collecting them to do an after-school music class at Boynton Church in the Third Ward. So look for your recorders, those guitars. You really were going to take guitar lessons four years ago, but if you haven't yet, you're not going to. Uh, don't worry about the piano. We don't want that. Uh, violins, uh, piccolos, uh, whatever. Look in those closets. We're ready for them. Harmonicas, yeah, and drums. Oh, yes, get those drums out of your house before your kid sees you. And lastly, uh, we still are get, uh, accepting financial donations and the brass bowls, the brass plates, which we aren't passing, but we are happy to receive your sacred money to give to sacred causes and good things. And I think that's it. Bill, I'm going to hand it over to you. Oh, we have two new TV monitors. That's all I know. Does it, Tim, do you want to tell me anything? William, do y'all want to say anything? No, they're fabulous. That's all we can say. They're working. That's the good thing. All right, thank you all so much, and I'm going to hand it off to Bill. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. I bring this greeting from Holly Hudley, dear beloved community. My youngest son tested positive for COVID last Tuesday. And our whole family is quarantining for the recommended 10 days when we will all retest. I hope to be here with you next Sunday, the 8th. Until then, Bill will definitely hold down the fort <laughs> with his loving hands and wise words. Those are her, her words. So um, thank you for being here. There's so much difference when there are people to talk to instead of the empty room, it makes a difference. And always we dedicate this time to um, growing in our understanding and acceptance of who we are, growing in our understanding and acceptance of who our neighbor is, and growing in our understanding and acceptance of sacred mystery. And no matter who you are, no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, you are welcome here. So I have brought a book that I want each of you to buy and to read by next week. 
This is it. <laughs> Have you ever seen one of these? I know Jim has. Anybody else ever seen one of these? Uh, I went online last night to Amazon to see what this particular one is selling for on Amazon, and one seller has it for $528. So if you want to buy a copy, you can buy it for a lot less, a revised version. This is a concordance. This particular concordance called the Young's Analytic Concordance of the Bible has every Greek and every Hebrew word in the Bible in it. And you can tell there are three really tightly packed columns on each page. Each line has about 100 entries. Now, you don't have to memorize this by next week, but you don't even have to read it. I've owned this particular book for 60 years. And I seldom use it, but I could not bear to part with it. You know, I just, it sits over there on the shelf next to my desk, and I look at it fondly. And remember when I did use it on a regular basis, I, I, I wanted to, um, I wanted to look it up because I wanted to see how many times the word fool in some form appears in the Bible. What would you guess? The word fool appears well over 400 times in the Bible. Uh, as so many words, the word fool comes from a Latin word that referred to a blacksmith's bellow. A fool then was a windbag, an, <laughs> an empty-headed person. All right? Now, I thought of that while working on this parable of the prodigal son because, and, and, and today's class, we're, we're going to talk about parables in general and how they function, the power of stories. Uh, but all three characters in the parable of what that we call the parable of the prodigal son behave foolishly. The younger son was a fool to demand his share of the inheritance that would come his when his father died. He certainly was a violator of religious law. He did not honor his father. And he went away and lived foolishly. The father himself behaved foolishly. He gives the young scallywag what he asked for. He gives up his standing as the patriarch of the family. And in, in the world where these people lived, there was a social map that everyone knew and followed. This map told people who they were, who they were related to, how to act, how to react. And at the center of this map was the father in the belonging system. Then came the family, and then came the village, and then the world beyond. And when he goes running out of the house, down the road, to embrace his errant son, he was behaving foolishly. A person of his statue in that time did not behave that way. Then, of course, the character who goes by the label the elder brother acts like a fool by excluding himself from what I think may be the central meaning of the story, which is a great celebration and an experience of the reassembly of this family that had been torn asunder. I thought about the song written by Johnny Mercer, made fa famous by uh, Frank Sinatra and then by Elvis. You know it? Fools rush in where angels fear to tread. And so I come to you, my love, my heart above my head. Though I see the danger there, if there's a chance for me, then I don't care. Fools rush in where wise men never go, but wise men never fall in love. So how are they to know? So open your heart and let this fool rush in. This uh, parable is a love story. Now, you may or may not be aware that very likely since the invention of the first religious rituals and religions, there have been labeled those, there have been those who have been labeled as fools. I'm just going to confine my remarks to the Jewish Christian arena. 
the Hebrew prophets were looked at as fools. Isaiah walked naked and barefooted for about three years predicting the forthcoming captivity of Egypt. Uh, and, and forecoming captivity in Egypt. The prophet Ezekiel lay before a stone which signaled the beleaguered Jerusalem, and though God instructed him to eat bread baked over human waste, Ezekiel asked to use cow dung instead. Now, you don't hear a lot of sermons on these two, <laughs> two scenes. Hosea married a prostitute to symbolize the infidelity of Israel over God. Jeremiah walked around with an ox yoke on his neck for years. And some took Paul's admonition to become fools for Christ's sake, literally. And they started a movement called Holy Fools. And these people used often shocking and unconventional behavior to challenge the accepted norms and to deliver prophetic statements. Paul talks a lot about how the so-called wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. Probably the most famous example of foolish behavior that you might be familiar with in the Western world is St. Francis. The Saint, Saint Francis, uh, from a very wealthy family, uh, gave away all his father's goods. And when his father got upset about that, he was a cloth merchant. <clears throat> Saint, a great crowd gathered. St. Francis took off all his clothes and gave them to the, the priest and walked away naked. I think somebody gave him clothes. The other mystic that you're probably familiar with is Julian of Norwich. She wrote the best known surviving book in English language written by um, a female mystic, Div Revelations of Divine Love. It was the first book written in English by a woman author. She wrote it in 1373 and, and uh, she had become seriously ill. And on what she thought was her deathbed, she had a series of visions. And then here's the foolish part. She asked for a cell to be built and connected to the church on the side of the church. And she was called an anchoress because she was anchored there. And she lived the rest of the, her life in that cell. And people would come to her and bring food and I suppose tend to other, other needs. Um, when the war, World War II came, that church was destroyed, and when they rebuilt the church, they rebuilt the cell where um, she, she stayed. In the <clears throat> Orthodox tradition, holy fools have played a very significant role. Um, I mentioned that we went to Russia where the painting that uh, the prodigal son is in St. Petersburg, and in Moscow, the church of St. Basil is named after... Um, a holy fool, the blessed Basil of Moscow, fool for Christ. And in the Orthodox tradition, they have a name for these saints. They're called Eurodives. I don't know if I said that correctly or not. Although many people have been given credit for this saying, I think it was Nietzsche who said, those who dance are considered insane by those who can't hear the music. And then, of course, there's Jesus, who took his life, and threw it away for a world he loved and for the people he thought should have full membership and participation in it. And one of the ways he did this was by telling stories, some of which upset the people who heard them so much that they wanted him executed. And of course, one of those stories begins once there was a fellow who had two sons. Father, Give me the share of the property that is coming to me. So the father divided the estate between the two boys. Now, I have assumed that everybody here knows what the word prodigal means, and you may not. Um, uh, the, the word prodigal means extravagant. And it points to someone who is reckless. There is some sort of extravagance on the part of all the characters in this story. We'll get the words prodigious and prodigy from the same Latin root word. A prodigy is someone who shows an, entire, an extraordinary talent at an unexpected time. So just in case you didn't know what the word means, that's, that's it. 
I think a more accurate title for this parable that we're going to spend some time looking at <clears throat> is the story of the compassionate father and his two lost sons. Now, um, the second thing to note that there have been countless numbers of books written about the parables of Jesus. Some of them are worthless. They're pablum. Some of them are so scholarly as to be virtually out of the reach except for somebody who speaks German or French or both. I own several uh, books on the parables. Um, I own Brandon Scott's book, uh, own, um, one by Clayne Snodgrass, Stories with Intent. And the other that I will mention is uh, Robert Capon. His uh, book is titled Kingdom, Grace, and Judgment. And I like that book because it talks about paradox, outrage, and vindication in the parables. It's a re very readable book. Brandon Scott is a member of the Jesus Seminar, and his is likely, this is likely the most comprehensive study of the parables in half a century. John Dominic Crossan said that the book, quote, is a superb synthesis of where we have come from in terms of literary analysis and where we are going in terms of social analysis. Snodgrass' book is probably the most comprehensive study of the parables you could ever hope to read. It has a history of how the parables have been interpreted over the centuries. And as you would know, the church has gone through different forms and styles of interpreting the Bible over a long period of time. And so Snodgrass has all of these. Plus, he has a very extensive bibliography uh, in, in this book. Um, the Capon book is just fun to read. And um, Capon was an Episcopal priest, very prolific author. He wrote a book called Supper of the Lamb, which is about everything from prayer to poetry to puff pastry. Actually, I read the book, and it's mostly about how to carve a lamb. It's a, it's a really good book. He's a great cook and has a lot of recipes in the book, if you like that better. Further, there have been a lot of books written just about this parable alone. I typed into my search engine, books on the parable of the prodigal son and instantly got 52 so-called best-selling books just on this one parable. So, now I want you to remember also that this parable, when we get into it, um, is just one story that Jesus used to answer his critics about why he practiced inclusion. It is not an exhaustive commentary on whatever we mean when we use the word God. In this parable, God is personal, God is welcoming, God is compassionate. But there are parables where God is presented as being absent. There are parables where one is encouraged to search for God. And there are parables where God is presented as one who searches. So I would say that sacred mystery is present, personal, Absent is seeking and desires to be sought all at the same time. Okay? Can you all hear me okay? Are you sure? Are you here? Are you sure? Now you tolerate the kind of stuff I've offered so far today. Pretty good. But the moment I utilize a good story, your attention goes up. Good stories entertain, inform, involve, they motivate us. A good storyteller can abduct us almost and take us into another world. And you know how easy it is for our bodies to be here and our hearts and minds to be somewhere else. That's why I ask, are you here? Are you sure? A good story can create a reality that is more real than real. And as the Native American storyteller would say at the beginning of a story, I don't know if this really happened or not, but I know it's true. Jesus was a master storyteller. In and with his stories, he forced people, as I hope we are forced, to see themselves and others from new angles. 
His stories conveyed messages that could not be easily evaded. I'm thinking right now especially of the story we call the parable of the Good Samaritan. He told it to people who thought that the only Good Samaritan was the Dead Samaritan. And yet he called him the Good Samaritan. That's what we call him. Now, are the parables of Jesus so complex that they require the kind of attention that we are giving this one? And the answer is both yes and no. I heard about these two guys who went into their favorite bar and ordered drinks all around for everyone. And um, when the bartender asked what the joyous occasion was, they said, well, we just finished a jigsaw puzzle in two days. And, and the bartender said a lot of people work jigsaw puzzles during the shutdown and probably less time than that. And one of the guys said, yeah, but on the box, this one said between two and five years. <laughs> so the parables are not jigsaw puzzles with over a thousand pieces. They were first told to people who probably could not read. And if they were not clear and compelling, they would not have been remembered. Nor become as loved as they are. Now, yeah, we're still scratching our heads over some of them, but they're not complex. Puzzling, yes, but not complex. And what is complex about them? is the context in which they were told and the mindset of the person who told them and the people who heard them. And we do not come at these stories out of anything remotely like that context. To understand any of the parables well, we've got to learn about all sorts of things that are not, use, not common to us. We've got to learn about ancient agricultural assumptions. We've got to learn about wedding customs. We've got to learn about relations of slaves to masters. We've got to know about the crucial importance of the family, the belonging system. We've got to know about Judaism. We've got to know about its history. The men and women who were our spiritual ancestors were not wrapped up in the technological world that we are. I know that Jesus didn't have an iPad he was speaking from when he spoke to the crowds. These were Middle Eastern people. They had a strong oral tradition. They didn't acquire knowledge like we do. Uh, they, they had two ways of expressing and experiencing the sacred. And the scholars refer to these ways as mythos and logos. And, and both were regarded as essential, and each was used to get at the truth. Each had its own area of competence. Myth was regarded as primary and essential, but each was used to get at the truth. Myth was concerned with what was thought to be timeless, constant. Myth looked back at the origins of life, to the foundations of culture, to the deepest levels of the human mind. Myth was not concerned with practical matters. Myth was concerned with meaning. I think that's why we're here. That's why you're here today. It's certainly why I want to be involved in learning about this material and, and offering it. Now, you know I'm always recommending books to read. And one of the books I find myself recommending over and over to people is a book by Jim Hollis called Finding Meaning in the Second Half of Life. If you haven't read it, you should. And if that seems too overwhelming uh, for your daily spiritual practice, get Hollis's uh, Living the Examined Life and read a chapter a day, 21 brief chapters, and read one in less than 10 minutes. And it's a good spiritual practice to have. Because it raises the point about what is your life about? What is the meaning of your life? Where am I heading? How can I bring enlarged being into the world? How can I continue to grow? And what are the arenas in which I want to grow? And I think that people who don't have useful answers to those questions fall into despair. So the mythos of a society provided people with a context that made sense of their lives. It directed people's attention to what was 
universal, to, to what was eternal. Mythos was deeply rooted in the unconscious, in the collective unconscious of the culture. So when people told stories about heroes who descended into the underworld and fought with monsters, they were bringing to light that which is unconscious in all of us. Now, none of this is accessible to the purely rational investigation, but it nonetheless has a profound experience, influence on our experience and our behavior. Because there's not a person in this room who cannot be captured by those deep forces from the unconscious that cause us to live lives either heroically or destructively. You enjoying the music? <laughs> Does this alone provide you with a mystical experience? Unless you're a musical savant, just looking at this piece of music gives you nothing. It has to be instrumentally interpreted by someone who is skilled to translate this into sounds that we can have the experience of Chopin. The music needs to be interpreted. Our spiritual ancestors had a very, very different view of history than we do. They were much less interested in what happened than they were in the meaning of what happened. For example, if you told someone in the first century that Jesus was born of a virgin, they would say, so what? After all, their current savior and God, Augustus, had been born of a miraculous union between Apollo and his mother when Apollo turned into a snake and crawled into his mother when she slept at night. It's a great story. In that time, interaction between gods and humans was a very common thing. So if you tried to appeal to get somebody to come to the temple of Apollo on Sunday morning because Jesus was born of a virgin, they'd probably turn you down because the temple of Apollo had better coffee anyway. <laughs> oh, that's the way it did. Now, Logos was equally important. Logos was the rational, pragmatic, scientific thought that allowed people to function in the world. Are you here? Because we have virtually lost mythos in our culture. We have made logos, logic, the basis of our society. Now, of course, in order for logos to work, it's got to be accurate. It's got to relate to life as it is. My point is there was a time, and Jesus lived in this time, when logos and mythos went hand in hand. Each was indispensable. They were distinct, but they were joined together as the heads and the tail of a coin are together. Each had a job to do. Each had its limitations. Logic, of course, cannot deal with human pain, suffering, or sorrow. It can't tell us about the ultimate value of life. That's the business of myth. That's the business of parables. Now, I know this is not a graduate seminar, um, but doing this brief series on these three parables of Jesus is intended to be preparation for a deep dive into the Gospel of John. Um, and, and I want to tell you at the beginning, the Gospel of John does not contain any parables as we know them about parable. The Gospel of John is one long parable. And, and, and when we get there, I want you to keep this in mind because if you try to approach the Gospel of John on a literal basis, you're going to miss the basic message of it because it is all mythos. By the 18th century, people in Europe and then in America had achieved such astounding success in science and technology, that we began to think that logic was our way to the truth. 
myth began to be distracted and dismissed as, as false and superstitious. So anytime anyone anywhere tries to turn myth into fact, it leads to problems. Not just small problems, but the kind of difficulties that meet, make people hate so much that they go and kill people for their sacred beliefs. So when Dr. Bankston was here a few weeks ago and we were dialoguing, he said something to the effect, maybe not an exact quote, but something to the effect that as he's gotten older, he finds himself believing less, but what he does believe, he believes more profoundly. Something. I wish I'd said that. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. And I, I, I agree with that. And, and one of the things that I have come to believe more and more deeply is that we have got to reintroduce the mythic back into our lives. And that's why I want to teach the Gospel of John. I don't mean that we should simply know about it with logos. We've got to know it with mythos. There's a difference between those two. You can't know mythos logically. That'd be just like looking at a piece of music instead of having it played. So one of the ways we can catch a vision of the transformed world Jesus had in mind is through stories. They help transform the lives of those who heard them. And even though we have heard it a hundred times before, we are hooked by the first few words of a good story. Once upon a time, a certain man had two sons. And then what? Further, when the early community shared with others their experience of their time with Jesus, they told stories about him that were parables. Hey, do you remember that time when Matthew was sitting by the tax collector's box and Jesus walked by and said, Matthew, come follow me, and Matthew got up and did it? Not only that, says another, I remember when the religious leaders cast, castigated people, uh, castigated Jesus for hanging out with people like Matthew. And Jesus said, these are my kind of people. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. So you go learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Now, <clears throat> that exchange involving Matthew doesn't sound like much more than a tidbit you might overhear at the restaurant table next to you. But that's because we don't live in a culture where family ties in the caste system were as powerful as they were in the time of Jesus. Because when Jesus called the fishermen to come and follow him and they left their father, that was a violation of a major cultural code in that time. It's a shocking story. So it's easy, at least it is for me, in our world and ways of comfort and ease, to lose sight of the fact that our world and ways are so contradictory to the way of living and seeing that Jesus taught over and over in both the Hebrew scripture and the Christian testament. We hear the struggle between the ways of this world and the liberating, loving desire of sacred mystery. Now again, I don't know about you, but my work with my own spiritual director shows me to be constantly in need of having ears that hear the sacred mystery calling me back to the heart of the true self and away from the ego. As I was reminded in my most recent session of spiritual direction of words from Thomas Merton that I'm sure you all have heard over and over, you are a spiritual being having a human experience, not the other way around. And as we get into the parable of the man who had two sons, remember that the call to life, love, and justice in the story is a call into the life in the spirit. It is not a call into religion. This story and the Gospel of John, when we get to it, are not calling us to be religious. We're being called to be faithful to our true identity. Now, religions are necessary, but they're also risky. 
Historically, religions have been the enemy of truth and of the sacred. You know, the prophets didn't go around complimenting the religious leaders of their day, nor did Jesus. Now, I think religions are necessary because they're one way we can have a container for the rituals that lead to transformation. But religions are also risky because they tempt us to become righteous and to think that we have the answer and that our view of things is the right one. We are also guilty of making so many assumptions about each other. If our spiritual work, if it is effective, will lead us to experience not that we have the answer, but rather that the answer has us, then we're doing the work correctly. Truth wants to reform us and not us shape it. So here's a story. It's about the power of stories, right? Here's a story. God and Satan were walking down the street one day having a friendly chat. And the Lord God Almighty bent down and picked up something. She gazed at it as it glowed radiantly in her hand. Satan, curious, asked, what is that? And the Lord said, this is truth. Here, Satan replied as he reached for it, let me have that. I'll organize it for you. <laughs> so we organize. In seminaries, they have year-long courses taught on many levels called systematic theology. <laughs> Our job is not to organize. Our job is to be organized, to be ordered. Our life and our world, after the image and teachings of Jesus, our job is to hear and respond to the story and likely to become holy fools in the process. We have to take that risk in order to get the rewards. So this that we do in here is certainly not about religion. I hope you learn some wise and useful religious things. I am truly committed to religious literacy. I think it's incredib incredibly important. Um, I'm working on a homily to do on Wednesday noontime communion in a couple of weeks. And I was reminded of the episodes that Jay Leno used to do. You remember when Jay Leno would go out on the street and interview people? And one time he asked people to name the four Gospels. And nobody could do it. But everybody could name the four Beatles. <laughs> That's our culture. Somebody even said that the epistles were wives of the apostles. So, uh, So I do hope you learn some really good, useful religious things. It's important to be religiously educated. But this is not about religion. This is about relationship. This is about being known, not about knowing. It's not about finding. It's about being found. Teachings on the path of paradox and contradiction are not about making God visible to us. It's about making us visible to God. We're not trying to see God in a new way. We're trying to see ourselves and our world and each other in a new way. This is not about something you do in order to have a spiritual relationship. This is how, about how a spiritual relationship results when we open our eyes to see the way God sees when we learn to open our arms to embrace those whom God embraces. Now, I want to tell you a story. It is a story. It is not a factually true story. But I want you to listen beyond the facts to the truth it contains. A young boy's parents were killed in a car wreck. And after the funeral, a man was driving the boy and his things to live with the boy's aunt. He had never met her and was asking the man driving the car what she was like. Is she mean or is she kind? Kind. 
Well, I have my own room. I bet it's already made up. Wonder if she'll let me have a dog. I bet she will. They were both starved by the time they got there. When they arrived, it was late. She was out on the front porch waiting for them. The light was on. Supper's ready. I've been waiting for you. Years later, long after he'd grown and gone, he got a letter from her. They had stayed in constant contact all the time. But this letter, though, was specific about her aging, about her terminal illness, about her imminent death, and about her fear of what was to become of her. And he wrote her back. I know exactly what you're going through. I remember when I was coming to live with you, I was so scared. What would become of me? Don't worry. I know exactly how it will be. Someone will be waiting up with, for you with the light on to hug you tight and to say, supper's ready. I've been waiting for you. So can you hear? Sacred mystery is calling us all the time to step a little further from darkness into light, a little further from bondage into freedom, a little further from death into life, all right in the here and now. And as we go forward, there is an opportunity for us to hear some perspectives and principles and practices we can use to enhance our experience of life. And following these perspectives, principles, and practices will likely make you excited, depressed, angry, afraid, joyful, hopeful, and ultimately more free and loving. So as you'll hear, Jesus and his followers used the power of stories to accomplish this. This business of becoming a holy fool is risky business. It is also rewarding. I haven't been doing this as I should. Got distracted. So the business of becoming a holy fool is risky business. It's also rewarding. Can you hear? No matter where you go this week, no matter what happens, remember this, you carry precious cargo, so watch your step. And I hope Holly and I will see you here next week. Thank you. <clears> Thank <throat> you.